wherever you may be. Welcome back to another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Join your host, Bill Alpstead, and co-host, sports writer and football analyst, Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Hey, Seahawks fans, welcome back to another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alfstead, sitting down with Keith Myers. Keith, welcome into the show. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I mean, the Seahawks aren't doing all right, but I'm doing all right. It's one yeah. of those nice things about um, having been at this long enough that um, I'm no longer... How good my week is going does not depend on a Seahawk win on Monday night because, well, they didn't do their job. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's and, nice and we're, to, to, we're here regardless. Yes, we are. We're here every week, no matter what. No lives. matter what. You know, this is what we signed up for. And um, now we're getting to, into uncharted territory where we're talking about things we haven't had to talk about before um we've been lucky enough to go on this amazing ride with the team um as they've been very successful since you and i have been doing this and prior to that and um just so happens after winning nine and then 10 11 12 win seasons we have a bad bad season now i you know if you go out on twitter which is just a complete i i do not suggest that you do no don't um, avoid it. Avoid it at all costs. It, it's crazy out there because according to the entire Twitter fan base of the Seattle Seahawks, we've had bad seasons for like five years in a row. This just isn't the first season. Um, and it's just been consistently downhill since 2015. And that's just simply not true. Yeah, um, it's not true at all. I mean, they... Uh, it's hard to win in the NFL. I get it. It's like, hard to win in the NFL. Playoff, one playoff 12, wins are hard to come by. I think that's they had the more twelve. Of, they had twelve wins last year. You cannot tell me that it was a bad year. Like I get that the whole idea of it's either, um, you know, a championship or a failure. Like I get that some people think that way, but then you have thirty-one teams that are failures, and you know. You can't you can't live by that in the NFL. There's two. It's the the margin for errors are razor thin once you're you get into the playoffs. I just your, you can't. The, the entire purpose of a season is to put yourself in a position at the end of the season to be there in the playoffs to begin with. So you're mm-hmm. giving yourself a chance at success in the playoffs. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Winning in the NFL is hard. There's a lot of parity at that level at the end where all those teams are competing and it has to do a lot with who's healthy at the time, who's got the momentum, who's in sync on offense and defense. You saw a team last year like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who had a mediocre regular season. Yeah, they were pretty really bad. really came alive in the playoffs and ended up taking I think they were 5-5 five and five after 10 weeks and then went on a run. And... Um, you know, got to 10 wins, got into, um, you yeah. know, got into the, um, the playoffs and continued winning. And, uh, and sometimes things line up that way. Like yeah. whoever you face in the playoffs, it's just, you know, it is what it is. And so, you know, you can beat a dead horse on this whole situation with, with the Seahawks this year. We are three and eight. There's no disputing the fact that we're, we're bad. We've been bad. And, the likelihood of us continuing to be somewhat bad, uh, even though our our competition um, is, is less than it was at the beginning of the year, is spot on. I mean, it's just it is what the, it is. The team has taken a step back since the beginning of the year for a, a number of reasons. A lot of it's health. I mean, everyone deals with injuries, but um, the Seahawks weren't as deep as they needed to be in key places, and they've taken a step back. Yep. Uh, Russell Wilson's not playing as well as he did in weeks one through three. Um, and uh, the defense, like, it stepped up in some ways. It's also stepped down in others. And, and it's uh, hard for them as well because the time of possession has been so lopsided. That yeah, it's, and the, it's not fair to put your defense out there for 40 minutes a game. Yeah, but you can't games put it on, in you a row. Can't, you can't only put that on the offense saying, oh, well, That's the offense is not moving the ball. That's because true, the but defense- when you only convert two out of eight third down attempts, 
Yeah, but when the defense is giving up eight minute drives in the first quarter, sure. like they did in this Absolutely. last game, you cannot blame that on the offense. That's entirely just the defense being bad. Correct. And they are giving up a ton of yards. They may not yeah. be giving up a ton of points overall, but they are definitely giving up the yardage. And, well, and yeah, so they're forth. giving they're giving they're not giving up a ton of points because they are getting stops and and forcing field goals a lot. Um but they're getting stops and forcing field goals after being on the field for eight minutes and giving up an you know an eighty two yard drive to get down to the four right. before they finally get a stop. Um, and you can't do that. You've got to get off the field faster. You got to get the ball back in your offensive hands faster. You got to be able to give them an opportunity to get a rhythm and that kind of stuff, which would help. And it would help if the offense converted a first down once in a while. So because they they don't <clears throat> seem to want to do that right now. So if you were going to have a conversation as your from your position of being uh, a co-host on this show to a and and speaking with a fan who was more in the line of let's blow it all up or let's get rid of Pete, let's keep Wilson, try to fix him, that sort of camp. What kind of conversation do you have about letting that person vent? At the same time, you're kind of reining it in a little bit and, and really kind of trying to broaden the perspective out a, a, a little bit so that a lot more than just those things are being considered as the well, season comes to an end and as we look forward to the off season. Well, I would look at when it comes to all of that is um, we as a franchise, you know, as fans of a franchise know what it's like to not have a franchise quarterback. We've been there for most of the history of this franchise. You have one. He may be playing poorly right now, but you have a franchise quarterback. You've seen him be an MVP caliber player. Um, he's one of the best in the league. He, I mean, get him a chance to get healthy. Given, and get given, some, the, given the resources. Given, if, given a little bit of blocking and yes. so he can get comfortable again. Um, he can be great. Uh, so I think if you want to get rid of Wilson, I'd be like, and go back, go to what? Go back to the days when you're bringing in John Freeze and playing John Kitna. Yeah, I think the argument is, yeah, you'd have short term pain, but you'd also around. be restocking the franchise with with young draft picks, young talent. Yes, but you you can't win without a quarterback. You can have the great roster. Because you've restocked your roster with all these draft picks. And there's no guarantees with those draft picks, let's be yeah, honest. Yeah, but even even let's say you do. Let's say you, you get high enough picks and you hit on a few of them and you you restock the roster so the roster is in great shape. You're not winning with a middling quarterback. You aren't winning with an Andy Dalton at quarterback. At some point. Okay, so, okay, so let's take a look at that argument. Uh, at some point, you have that conversation. Now, whether that's this year or whether that's 10 years from now because Russ wants to play for until he's in his 40s, um, at some point you end up having a diminishing return and then you have to figure out the direction of your franchise. Um, so what you're confident in is that Russ has easy, like at least five more years of really good top-end football. And so yeah. this argument is m mute. And we just need to move on to a, another argument. I think we should move on to another argument. I mean, if if Russ doesn't want to be here because he's tired of Pete Carroll's way of doing things, or he's tired of the way that John Snyder builds a roster that doesn't include winning in the trenches in front of him and expecting him to do um, to to mask a bad line, which isn't working this year, he's not able to do that. Um, you know, if he's tired of that and he's like, okay, I'm going to go play for a team that's going to build around me and put blockers in front of me so that I can look good and, and, and be comfortable and, and put up numbers and, and, um, you and know, go have a chance that to, way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, if he decides to do that, then fine. He decides to do that. Um, if, but as a, if I'm a decision maker or I'm a fan of the team who's questioning the decision makers, I'm not giving up the best quarterback that this franchise has ever had for no reason. What reason are you giving up on the best quarterback you've ever had? He's still in his prime. He's a little bit broken right now because he's not, his eye level is terrible. He's not looking downfield at coverage. He's looking at pass rushers. Um, and that needs to end 
Um, and that will, would end as he get, uh, it will end as he gets more comfortable behind a competent line. He just doesn't have a competent line. Um, but he's still the best quarterback this franchise has ever had, who's still in his prime. Why would you move away from that and go back into quarterback purgatory? Agreed. Because that's that's what you're asking. You're, unless you're, he wants out, like you said. Un, unless he, if he wants out, sure. I mean, because you, you don't want a guy who's here that doesn't want to be here. You don't want to. You don't want to deal with that. If he wants out, then he wants out. Um, but if he doesn't, I'm sorry. Because Seahawks fans are them. are certain. In fact, it's already started to hear this over and over and over. The narrative is going to build like drums in a jungle this offseason that Russell Wilson's unhappy. He was unhappy last year. Therefore, we lost more games this year. He's going to be even more unhappy, and it's absolutely certain that he's going to demand. Now, now that is the it, narrative, and it's only just started. It's, and it's based on what? Nothing. Nothing. It's based, exactly. It's Nothing. based on it's based on the fact that he came out and said he was tired of getting hit. Yes. And he wanted it to throw the ball more and not be so run, run, pass, punt, um, like they had been under uh Schottenheimer. And I think those were both honest like assessments. And, and the quite honestly, and Keith, and you know this, a lot of people dismiss this, but you know this. Pete came out first. And said, uh, yeah. "We need to focus more on the on on the offensive line this year, and in our running game to help balance our attack to give Russell Wilson the best tools available to make mm -hmm. the offense work." And Wilson came out and echoed that, and all of a sudden and that he became that he up. was yeah he was unhappy and all of that. And I think there was, I mean, we there is the re the report which I believe because it's been um, it's been backed up by other report so that you know there was a an incident where you know he, Wilson ended up storming out of a meeting cuz he wanted a voice on how to fix the offense as it was sputtering and was basically told to go away um and then with those comments i believe that there was a part in the front office that was like kind of tired of of you know some of the stuff that's gone on and and was looking at options at possibly moving him but not seriously i mean think about what the bears offered that would have been a record-breaking trade in terms of compensation level like nothing has even been close to what the bears offered and to it, of it wasn't john senator that nixed that it was pete carroll that nixed that so yeah. so that relationship you know if you believe them and i do because there's no incentive for them to come out and and lie uh, that that Pete and Russ, you know, mended that thing and, and they became close again and yada, yada. So, um, okay, so let's set, set that narrative aside. Let's get, and we'll get to the 49er game too, promise. We're going to set that up a little bit. Um, let's get to the Pete Carroll narrative. See, because, this is a much harder conversation to have because this has been the best era of Seahawks football ever in terms of number of wins. Um, this year has been bad. We get that, but let's back up from that. Pete Carroll has had three years in his entire time here, including this year when they haven't made the playoffs, including this year. Um, and one of those years they went nine and uh, seven. And that was so disappointing that they, he fired his coaching staff and brought in all new, and brought in new coaches because he was so disappointed in how that year went down. And they were nine and seven before Pete Carroll. They had never had back to back 10 win seasons and nine and seven became so disappointing that you fire your whole coaching staff. Like that's the difference between the Pete Carroll era Seahawks and every other. Yeah. Era Cause we went nine Seahawks. and seven for 40 straight years before Pete Carroll showed up. You, no, know you, you, know, uh, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. It was mediocre, you know. Nine and seven was as good as it got. Right, um, right, right, right. So, you know, okay, so, but but the argument so, is, is that Pete Carroll's 70, time has, has passed him mm -hmm. by, the game's passed him by, the offenses have evolved, he has not, it's time to go in a new direction. This season only proves it further. 
I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of rational talk out there, but there's a lot of irrational talk out there's there. There's a lot of irrational talk, and I, I think we and can, we can bypass the irrational. I, I totally and, agree. And stick to the more rational part. The reason why Let's, I said this is a harder argument to have is because that all of that, what the part I was saying about um, Pete Carroll era being great is true. It's also true that uh, the, the NFL moves on. It moves quickly. It adapts. It, it adjusts. It, it, um, it evolves very rapidly. And we saw that with Mike Holmgren. And by the time he left Seattle, uh, the NFL had flown way past him. And he didn't have this advanced, um, hard-to-stop scheme on offense. He had an archaic thing that teams didn't struggle with. They knew how to attack, and they, they made it look silly. And I believe we're starting to see some of that with, with what's going on um, with Pete Carroll, his defensive scheme just isn't working. That, or he needs the perfect personnel to run it. And when he doesn't have the perfect personnel, and I'm talking like Pro Bowl and all pro level personnel in key spots, he's not able to operate that thing. And teams have figured out how to beat that defense. Well, and a lot of, a lot of the reason the, the Rams. Yeah, you a know, lot of the reason that the uh, that defense worked so well when it did. I mean, yes, when when he first came in, it was new. There was there were aspects of it that um, were innovative and d definitely changed what the NFL was doing. There's a reason why uh, other teams started emulating it. He was losing coaches because they wanted to run his defense. Um, that's not true anymore. And in stack, in fact teams are now moving away from his defense because the NFL is adapted and that's been a problem the last couple of years it hasn't worked at all and before that it really only worked because of Earl Thomas yes because he was able to hide some so well, what's happened the last couple of years where we have a little bit of personnel deficiencies talent deficits um and and the years have started pretty rough but then they've come on and kind of tweaked it fixed it whatever adapted in mid-season and seemingly made it work now it worked better last year for a while because the offense was a little better but this year with the offense exposed completely the defense has nothing to to mm -hmm. fall back on and so it's just all them but um so how do you how do you kind of go forward then like I, if you're the if you're the front office this year uh do you give credit to the 10 years uh or 11 years of overall performance uh, and and give Pete an opportunity to say, yeah, I want to stay here. I'm committing to be here. I'm under contract. I'm working with Schneider. We have our franchise quarterback. Let's get. Let's have an opportunity to make the changes that we think are necessary to get the to get back on course. Have they earned that opportunity? If Pete Carroll is willing to do that, yes, he's earned that op opportunity. Which and that's as much as Seahawks fans, including possibly me by the end of the season um, don't want to just give him that because of the fact that, you know, he's becoming kind of a dinosaur. Um, he has earned it and he's going to get to choose when he leaves, unless he has multiple bad years in a row. Um, one bad year, especially after a 12, one season is not going to get Pete Carroll jettisoned. Um, but, but will the 12 win, years and the 11 win seasons with the one and done playoffs doesn't plus matter. the bad year it doesn't does matter. that change no, the equation no. at all you get 12 wins doesn't the one and done playoffs is um it's that's people whining i mean it, it really comes down to that that's you you will win you win 12 you get 12 wins in a year and you put together uh that kind of season and um i'm sorry the regular seasons matter way more than uh, people are wanting to claim this. Oh, only the playoffs uh, that was, matter. That was going to be my next not, question to you. Is, so. it, only the playoffs matter. Well, no, that's not actually true. The regular season matters more. Um, and so by going 12, but going 12 wins and now this year they have an off year and they have some, you know, some things that didn't go right. And there were some definite like issues and, and um, we saw some decline of certain players that really couldn't, the kids actually couldn't afford to see a decline. Um, and that's what's leading to the bad year. Uh, 
he's still one year away from a 12 win season, two years away from an 11 win season, three years away from a 10 year win season. I mean, he went back to back to back double digit wins and then had and one improved bad year. every year and had one bad year after that. You're not, you're not firing him that now. Um, okay. Let's say, but, okay, but that stop. to let's, me, I'm going to say, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Ask your question. With all that said, let's say that Pete Carroll decides to, to, to stay, he's sold his vision to to management and uh, Russell Wilson. So the band stays together for for another run. Um, in your mind, and and we're going to spend a lot of time doing this, but what are the key factors moving forward? If that is the case, Russell Wilson stays, Pete Carroll stays, John Schneider stays. They've got seven picks in the draft, no first round pick. They've got. $50 million to spend in free agency. What happens next? Like, okay. do they need to go out and sell to the fan base that this is the right move? No. I mean, what do they owe the team and what do they owe the, 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 the fans? They don't have this, to come out. They, they don't have to come out and sell to the fan base that, uh, keeping the band together is the right move when you've got a hall of fame band right um you know hall of fame coach hall of fame quarterback yeah i mean you don't you don't have to um you know if um yeah but do we you know, rest on our laurels like that does pete carroll comfortable with that no, but but it doesn't. What I'm saying is they don't. You don't have to sell that. This is a this is a team that that wants to win and they want to do things. If if Pete Carroll wants, if he if he actually is worried about Seahawk Twitter and their level of insanity, um, what he would do is do the part that I think he needs to do to be successful. Um, and he needs to buy into that and that he needs to bring in outside eyes for his defense. He needs I someone. I totally agree, Keith. He yes. needs someone that isn't Ken Norton Jr. and isn't currently on staff to come in and evolve his scheme. New eyes, new ideas, using the basics of the Pete Carroll defense. But just a new way of, of thinking, a new way to take advantage of the players that they've got. Because the biggest problem that you and I both saw early in the year was that they were playing a scheme, not players. And they weren't doing what needed to be done to put players in place to make plays. They were asking players to do stuff because the steam, the scheme dictated that a strong safety should play in a certain way, even though you've got a strong safety who doesn't do those things well and does other things exceedingly well. And they didn't play to the strengths of the player. And when Pete Carroll first came into the league, that was who he was. He was well, I think that guy that, that they've gotten at, away from as well. What we talked about, touched upon last week was the identity of the, of the team itself, the identity of the defense, the identity of the offense. Yeah. You know, we've always associated Pete Carroll and his identity on offense being physical being a run team it's not always about running 75 percent of the time it's about dominating when you do run it's about dominating the line of scrimmage yes. and they don't do they get dominated on the line of scrimmage. right right and that's what's so happening to me everybody. that that would need to change the yep. same goes on the <clears throat> defensive side you've got to dominate that um, that's, that front four when it comes to the, on offense, I, I'm absolutely going to agree because I think Pete Carroll did what needed to be done on the offensive side of the ball this last year. He brought in fresh eyes. He brought in fresh ideas. He's got a scheme that has evolved. I agree, and, Keith. I and do. if they weren't if they weren't getting dominated up front on every single, they just don't play, have the personnel to run what they want to run. Yeah, they they just don't. They're getting dominated. Which up front. I which I have to say is a critical mistake by this team by this office mm -hmm. by john I, schneider that just underestimated the the need to improve that area of the team. i mean they, they they went and got gabe jackson which has they re, they went and re-signed chris carson keith and and he hasn't I'm started time, more than 12 about, games i'm in talking a about up season. front I'm i know that you front. are but i'm but it's a combination 
Yeah, I mean, okay. Chris Carson is the type of runner that you it want. It is the type of runner, it, but because he's he unavailable. So the best ability is availability, and you know that, and I know that, and the team should know that, too, and, and they, they do, don't. And they do know that, and that is why yeah, and Alex Penny Collins was the backup. is around. Well, and that's also why Alex Collins is around. That's why they drafted DJ Dallas last year. They know they need backs. They want guys of a certain type that are physical, but Chris Carson is a tone setter. He's yeah, a physical no, back. You and I back. see it the and same way. Is, we just differ a little bit on the personnel. I, I, I don't mind that they re-upped Chris Carson um, and it didn't work. It hasn't worked out completely because he got hurt. The problem that I have is up front in front of both of them, him and you know Carson and Wilson, is that the offensive line is crap. And yeah, and well, they've there, certainly made some mistakes. Along there's the way. no, there, there's been no running lanes for Alex Collins whatsoever. He's getting hit before he gets to the line almost every run. That's why they averaged 1.8 yards per rush um, in this last game against a team that's not even that good. Um, and so they're not getting any push. They're not doing anything in the in the running game, uh, and they can't pass block to save their lives. So, um, I mean, that was really the problem. They, you know, Dwayne Brown is a shell of who he used to be. And he used to be fantastic. And actually, he had a pretty dang good la year last year. In um, fact, he but, had a pretty good game against Washington. He was, you know, he did. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean he, he has been. But in other games of this season, he's been terrible. And yes. that's not something that you would have ever said about Dwayne Brown. And not injury-oriented either, just terrible, just based just, on the just, fact that he got trucked because he can't get – he doesn't have the, the sidestep speed enough to get – yeah, he's because he's old, and and I'm sorry, it's, it, but there's a reason why the Seahawks, despite Russ wanting Brown signed and Brown mm -hmm. wanting a new contract, another thing, I don't, I John Snyder did right. I do by agree not with that. by not Absolutely. giving in and giving Brown a big deal because. But they also did wrong by not bringing Creed Humphrey. So I mean. That's a while. Yeah. No, and I, I'm with you on that. Like you drafting Creed Humphrey. I mean, Creed Humphrey was terrible. Like the first but they, three but they drafted but they, Lewis, but they, but they waited but until the third or fourth round to draft Lewis. They didn't Lewis, draft a center. They had a center that was right in their laps. They went Lewis out and was, got Gabe Jackson. That's a great trade. I like Gabe yeah. Jackson. Lewis has been great. Yeah. Um, he's been hurt this year and has his and play they moved has fallen him. off. But moving him didn't matter. He was fine until he started getting. But hurt. it does matter in the way that the continuity overall changes and the dynamics change, and the you know, and Shell lost his buddy next to him on the left side, so now he's got Jackson, which is fine. Shell and Jackson seem to be a nice pairing for the most part. Shell's kind of eh. Shell's, I, I, Shell's I, not. Shell's not. Not. They probably good. aren't going to resign him, but I guarantee you, if he comes back for like three, three and a half million, I bet you they sign him again. Just because if, they need to have somebody yeah, there something. that because they've got three new offensive linemen. If they just had Shell oh, and two to. other premier kind of starters, that offensive line probably would be okay. I mean, we would be having, I think we'd be having a different conversation if they had gone inside and drafted Creed Humphrey, which they I should do have too. done. I because really now do. you've got, now you've got your interior of your, of your line. You got two guys that are, um, young, really physical, um, good players that are growing into becoming great players next to um, Gabe Jackson, who's been a pro bowler and um, is a been a great player. He's had like one off game this year. Um, he's pretty much the only offensive lineman that has done anything of note for Seattle um, this year other than get bowled over. Uh, and so, you know, just looking at you know, at, at that, if they, it, I think we'd be having a different conversation because we'd be like, okay, so Shell's not the guy on the right, and Dwayne Brown is is deteriorated. So you need new tackles, but now you need two new tackles and a center. That's it, it. plus you, you know, you look at Lewis, who's having an kind of a rough year because of injury, and you're like, do you have anyone on your offensive line? Um, and I think that's the problem is that they don't have anyone on their offensive line other than Jackson. And so Wilson's getting killed. And that's what's killing the offense. Um, you know, but if you, if yeah. they drafted Humphrey and they had, okay, Lewis would still be playing, you know, poor because of the injuries, but they would at least have three guys that they can depend on next year. I just think the perception of the offensive line is drastically different. Instead, they chose to, to draft Eskridge and I kind of, 
get that they really liked his skill set. And then they knew that um, the depth chart at wide receiver was an issue because they only had two guys and maybe Freddie Swain um, and they wanted a fourth receiver they could count on, but it cost you the opportunity of having an anchor in the middle of your offensive line for the next decade. And that to me is a mistake. Go win in the trenches before you win on the outside. Okay. So lesson learned, let's assume that they, they do that. Um, So that seems to be the formula on the, on the offense repair, the offensive line, get a running back, you know, starting running back. Chris Carson will be back, but you can't depend on Chris. I mean, he can start the year for you, but it's proven over, you know, three years in a row that he can't finish. Will he be back? All right. So defense. You're not going to answer that question? No, because I I don't know. I He's under contract, but that doesn't mean anything. It depends on what they do in the offseason. The you know, if they really do throw everything that they have at the problems, Chris Carson won't be back because Chris Carson is a problem. See, and I it's think not that... because of the running style. I love Chris Carson when he's, but he hasn't been that guy. Not this year, only a couple games last year. He's a memory now. It's time to move forward with a guy that actually is available for 14 to 16 games, 17 games, that's so, going to truck people from the beginning to the end of the season and be available and in the playoffs. You're not, refer- you're not referring to Adrian Peterson, who the Seahawks signed to the practice squad today for reasons I'm AKA still Adrian to James. Yeah. <laughs> this, the Seahawks are, are reaching way back and, and I'm not exactly sure. So here's, here's the deal with the, with the current season. Let's, let's skip the defensive part of the discussion because we're going to have plenty of time to talk about all this stuff. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the game coming up, the 49ers come into town. Uh, the Seahawks are three and eight. They're not technically mathematically eliminated from the playoffs. So I do expect there's Seattle, only, there's only five or six good teams in the NFC. And then there's a whole bunch of teams from Seattle all the way up through um, the Saints that are just not very good. Yeah. And so competing for that seventh, um, really, yeah, because there's six. So really that seventh spot, because I would put um, probably the Vikings in there um, as a team that's probably going to get get a spot. But you're looking at all those teams competing for one spot, and none of them are any good. So is it possible for the Seahawks to make a run and, and get well, up there? Sure, because none of those teams are going to run away with that spot. And I would have had a better conversation had we pulled out that win in Washington um, because this would have had more meaning. But, um, you know, they just need to lose one more time and they're mathematically done. They're currently 15th overall Mm -hmm. in the NFC. Out of of 16 teams. The only other team is Detroit Mm -hmm. that's worse right now than Seattle. It's hard to even say that out loud. Miami Um, has more wins than Seattle. So what I was going to say, though, is is um, Seattle's still going to do everything they can to win. Like, and they should, because that's the mentality you want to have on your team. That That's a Pete Carroll thing. That's a Russell Wilson thing. These guys are not going to give up. Um, and, and if they happen to lose this week, um, then you start talking about some of the things that we've been talking about, looking at players, trying to evaluate your roster, all that kind of stuff. So... So let's go back to the last time these two teams played because Seattle won and they won handily and they were clearly the better team. Yeah. They and they know clearly. how to defense Jimmy Garoppolo. They, do you feel that they're clearly the better team right now going into this game? Seattle? Yeah. No, no. On the field. I do not. No. On the field when they played, the Seattle was clearly the better team. Yeah. No, Seattle owns quote unquote, the 49ers, like the 49ers own the, you know, the Rams Rams. and the Rams own Seattle. (laughs) You you know what I'm saying? It's one of those things where I think these two teams just kind of whatever. And, and the 49ers in the last, well, since Harbaugh left just have not been a great team at all in uh, Seattle. Um, So, you know, if I was a 49er fan, and I was, uh, uh, you know, paying attention to the team, I would say, yeah, I think my 49ers are going to win, but I'm not really confident about it. See, I think that when we watched the team, when we watched the game, the Seahawks were 
easily the yeah. better team. They were the yeah. better team. And, and, it, better. and it seemed like we were going to ascend into a yeah. nice season and, that was going to just be great. And it just fell and, off the rails after that. Yeah. And, and going into this game, I'm sorry, the CX are not the better team. San Francisco is playing better football and they're doing so with a really mediocre quarterback and no running. Played well move, last week. They had to move their best wide receiver to running back because they don't have any running backs. Um, and, you know, they've got a defense that has got nice talent in places and then is just, uh, you know, desert. Um, well, their, second, their secondary has been their weakness. Um, they're they're surrendering a quarterback rating on the year of 50, or excuse me, 95.8, ranking 23rd and 24th in completion, completion percentage allowed. Mm -hmm. but they're you know jimmy bosa or excuse me not jimmy uh nick bosa is is having a nice season he's got 11 sacks total he's got a, a sack plus in four out of the last five games so you've got to pay attention to him um they're not they don't give up big plays so their secondary like i said is kind of gives up a lot of throws overall but they don't give up big plays they're seven yards um per attempt is I think fifth, no eighth in the NFL, and uh, ten point five yards um, per completion is is ranked eighth. So the the advantage that Seattle has though is is um, Samuel's out in this game. It looks like with a strained groin, um, and and our and our run defense is is really good. So they have Elijah Mitchell. It's who's not come really, on for them. It's not really good. It's but we're allowing 3.9 okay. yards per carry, which is second in the NFL, Keith. Here's the problem. We're allowing 124.9 yards per game, which is 24th overall. So mm -hmm. you 3.9 yards per carry average is second, 24th overall in yards. What does that tell you? That tells me that we're broken. <laughs> what that what that what that tells you is that one teams are ahead of Seattle and running the ball because they can run up the clock. Two, they're being that's effect, very true. They're being effective at throwing on first and first down, and they're bringing up a lot of third and twos, third and ones, so they can run the ball and get the first and keep drives going. Yes, they are. Yes, exactly. Keith. You don't have, they don't, I mean, yeah, the CX are second best in yards per play, but they're getting so many opportunities to run the ball because of game script. And because Washington ran 80 some odd plays in, in the game against Seattle. Yeah. And we ran 43. And be, the defense kept giving up long drive after long drive. How many 13, 14, 18 play drives has this team given up this year? The answer is at least one in every single game. And most games, it's been three or four. Yes. I mean, that yeah. you a lot of times we're, we only have one that. drive a quarter. Yeah. And, and it's usually three and out. In this last game, there were, <laughs> there were, there were two, two drives in the entire game. There was the one that put Seattle up seven three, and the one at the end of the game that gave Seattle a chance to win. Um, and then, and, and, and everyone's complaining about how many you know targets DK Metcalf has. Well, who cares at yeah. this point? That's the that's only one of several things that's broken. There's a lot of things that's broken, and most <laughs> and most of the things that are broken um, on defense. The biggest thing that's broken is they can't get to the quarterback, um, and on offense, what's broken is they can't block anyone. Well, they're losing in the trenches. They're losing yes, on offense right. and defensive line. That's you and where I they're are see it exactly the same way. The reason why the Seahawks are number two in um, yards per play against the run is because their linebackers uh, have been really good. Brooks is playing at a really high level, mm -hmm. and Bobby Wagner is going to lead the NFL in tackles again. Yeah, and Daryl Taylor's uh, been great on the edge. Yeah, and so I mean he's not putting up the stats, but the strong side linebacker in this team never puts up stats. But he's uh, right. as far but as he's tackles. forcing stuff inside though too. He's in which yeah, which is allowing you know Wagner to come over and, and make mm -hmm. that tackle. So um, as a group, I think they're the linebackers are playing well, but the the line isn't. Um, Al Woods, Monet, they're okay, but they're not. They're not. But special that's players. it. There's no rotation and, depth there. No, there's not because you got Puna Ford, who 
is good but doesn't have and anything. And you've decided to 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 play, you know, Rasheem Green and Collier in that three tech rotation role. What's are just not mm-hmm. they're not they're, suited for it. They they're just five aren't. Tech. They're five tech guys. You've got so many five techs. You're like, oh, we'll rotate them in, and they'll yes. help with our pass rush. And uh, Rasheem Green's done okay. He's you know actually played pretty well this year. Um, but Collier's been a waste of space when he has been active and he's been a healthy scratch in more than half the games. Uh, they're getting nothing out of Dunlap. They're getting very little out of Kerry Hyder. Uh, and those are the guys that are supposed to be starting. Those are the guys that are supposed to be uh, leading this pass rush. And it hasn't been. The only guys that have been productive as pass rushers have been Daryl Taylor and Alton Robinson. And they're, yeah, both being been... used, they're both being used at strong side linebacker. I mean, Benson Mayoa, who they kept around and 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 gave money to, despite no reason to do so whatsoever, um, he has one sack on the year. He's supposed yeah, to be your, your situational pass rusher that you know only plays twenty five percent of the snaps, but gets after the quarterback on third and long and puts up numbers and gets pressures, and he hasn't done that. Like all of the vets on the defensive line have disappointed every single one of them, with the exception of Puna Ford. On Woods, you know, for the most part. I mean, Woods has stayed healthy, and he's he's been. I in guess. There. I mean, you're right. He's he stayed healthy. He's been in there. He's done that. I guess maybe the expectation wasn't high for him, so you can't say he hasn't. He's, a, he's kind of a run stuffer, and they've asked him to kind of play a little bit of three tech, which he's not suited for. And um, Brian yeah. Monet has just kind of been a guy. I mean, he's been okay but brian monet is not the guy you know he's and he's he's never gonna be the guy right he's fine he's fine as 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 a third rotational defensive tackle i think the team i think the team needs to move him to nose tackle and let puna ford get after the quarterback from the three tech position more often and that just doesn't seem to be the way that the the team's gonna go even next even next year i don't know we'll see We'll see yeah. what they get personnel wise, because that's definitely going to be an area of focus. Mm-hmm. So we'll see what happens. Um, anything else? We didn't really do this game. No, sorry, because it's, sorry everybody. The, it's, well, hard, and it's hard. It's hard to it's do the be games. Hard. They really don't matter. Yeah, it's going to be hard to do that. I mean, that's, we really look at it as 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 a, a way to evaluate Seattle. Now, it's not about winning games and trying to make a run or any of that. It's about right. how do what do we see from the roster? Do you have is, do you have any hope the Seahawks are going to win this game? Well, do you have any hope the Seahawks are going to win any game? <laughs> I mean, the way that they play against anybody right now, it's like you've got to see those glimmers mm-hmm. of hope. Now, you saw a couple of plays where Russ was able to, you know, put some points on the board in this last game. But other than that, it's like yep. there were there the two a- the two scoring drives, the the six play scoring drive um, in the beginning of the game. And was it a five play scoring drive at the end yeah. of the game? Those two drives that looked like the offense that did, but they still relied heavily on Russell Wilson to make which, those throws, which they're, which they're going to because all the running yes. backs are hurt. But, um, Adrian Peterson, man, come on, anyways. Um, but those, those two drives are a glimmer of hope, but between them, between them, there was a stretch of six straight three and outs, yeah. So, there was, I mean, there were other there were other drives in there. Do you but there have was a hope stretch. that they could win any of their remaining games, not just this game? Yes. Like the Lions are on the schedule. There's, you know, they'll beat a couple, the couple of games. The Lions are bad. The Lions, so, are, the Lions are the Lions are bad compared to bad teams. The Lions are bad compared to Jacksonville. They're bad compared to Houston. They're going to be bad compared to Seattle. Here's what I would like to see. I'll just be, you know, just be completely honest. I would like them to kind of stick with their roster and just kind of let Russell Wilson play through this situation to see if he can somehow gain some traction again and get his confidence back and at least be on target again and have that functioning before the end of the season. I'd like to see the run game kind of go, even if it's from a couple of running backs who aren't even on our roster today. That, that would come in and maybe gl- give us a little bit of a glimmer of hope. Um, maybe have Stone uh, Foresight take over at left tackle at some point just to kind of see what we've got, or at least have two or three drives a game. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about, I think, is just players having opportunities to kind of 
make an impact mm -hmm. so that we know in the off season what we've got, what we can use, what we can count on, what we can't count on. So I need yep. a little. Let's get out of here. Let's do it. Find Keith on Twitter at Myers NFL. I'm at NW Seahawk. The show is at Hawks Playbook. Seahawksplaybook.com is our website. Find us on YouTube and all your favorite podcast platforms. And please subscribe. That would be great. So until next time, go, go Hawks. Hawks. Seahawks Playbook Podcast listeners, thanks for joining us for another edition of the show. You can find us on Twitter. Bill is at NW Seahawk. Keith is at Myers NFL. And the show is at Hawks Playbook. You can listen and subscribe to the show at SeahawksPlaybook.com.